Hi, I'm Megan Brill, Executive Director with the Downtown West Orange Alliance. We're very excited to be sponsoring Joe Fagan's TV show, Discover West Orange. We hope that you'll learn something more about Main Street and come back and enjoy some of the great things we have to offer downtown. Hi, I'm your host, Joe Fagan, and welcome to this edition of Discover West Orange. This monthly program, sponsored by the Downtown West Orange Alliance, is dedicated to raising awareness and preserving our rich local history. On the afternoon of July 3rd, 1863, General Pickett, under orders to attack from Robert E. Lee, led a gallant but futile charge against Union forces at Gettysburg. This attack occurred on the third day of battle and has since become known as the high tide of, of the Confederacy. Although the, the Union line ultimately held, it was overrun and nearly breached. Rebel forces were bravely repelled and the entire Confederate army was put into full retreat. Had the attack been successful, it likely would have resulted in the eventual demise of the Union and the United States as we know it today. Although the American Civil War lasted two more years, this defeat at Gettysburg was a turning point and marked the beginning of the end of the Confederacy. Many young men from the Oranges were there to defend freedom that day, and some never returned home as they lie mortally wounded on the fields of that small Pennsylvania town. It can be argued that it was the most monumental and fateful day of American history in the 19th century. Defending freedom, however, is an enduring commitment that knows not the limits of time or the boundaries of nation. Just like at Gettysburg, many young men from the Oranges were also there to defend freedom in the 20th century as they came ashore on the beaches of France during World War II. A June day 70 years ago when British, American, and Canadian armed forces landed on the shores of Normandy. The liberation of Nazi-occupied France began on dawn on June 6, 1944, when over 5,000 ships and 11,000 planes crossed the English Channel on D-Day. The free world grasped at hope on one of the most pinnacle days in all of world history, when the future of humanity and the freedom of countless thousands in Europe were at stake. Failure simply was not an option on the day of days that turned the, that turned the tide of the war as the Allies began their assault on Hitler's Atlantic Wall. On today's show, we will honor the passing of the 70th anniversary of D-Day and examine some important connections to West Orange, and one in particular that endures with monumental and unsurpassed significance as we discover West Orange. As a young boy growing up in West Orange, I first learned about World War II from my father, who served in the South Pacific during the war. I, I subsequently learned the names of famous generals and battles, but really ver knew very little about how all the details connected. In my young mind, which lacked proper understanding, D-Day existed only as a place where soldiers came ashore and won a battle that defeated the Germans. It all seemed so natural, because after all, if we won the war, why wouldn't we win the battles? And was there any ever question as to who would win? This thinking, however, was completely devoid of any reality of the horrors of war, not to mention the absolute uncertainty that D-Day or any battle during wartime brings. My first real insight to D-Day came when I was about 10 years old in the mid-1960s. Our family was living on Moore Terrace, and one day we saw our neighbor was moving. He emptied out the discarded con contents of his house and placed them at curbside for pickup in one big mountain of garbage. As they say, one man's garbage is another man's treasure. For all the young kids in the neighborhood, including myself, this wasn't just a treasure. It was the bonanza gold. We all rummaged frantically through the mother load of cool things, only to be scolded by our parents when we returned home with an armload of someone else's trash. I had to bring it all back, except only one thing which my mother allowed me to keep. It was a newspaper that I found in the pile of garbage which bore a one-word headline in bold type, Invasion. It was the Newark Evening News from June 6, 1944, 
further stating that we gained a beachhead in France. This newspaper, which I have with me here today on set, was the beginning of an epiphany about D-Day that has since become a lifelong quest to learn more about what this day truly meant. June 6, 1944 was a day of sacrifice in the name of humanity, filled with countless brutal and deadly struggles. Allied forces came ashore on the French coast of Normandy along the English Channel to break Hitler's stronghold on the European continent. The five landing zones were known as Utah, Omaha, Sword, Juneau, and Gold Beaches. By sunset on that fateful day, Allied forces had gained a foothold in Europe. The end of the war would be less than a year away. Just like Pickett's charge at Gettysburg was a vital turning point in American history, so was D-Day in both American and world history. Just like the boys from the Oranges who stood tall at Gettysburg, so did current and future West Orange residents on the shores of Normandy. Perhaps the most well-known of D-Day's stories that is that of West Orange's former mayor, Jimmy Sheeran. Only two years after graduating West Orange High School in 1942, Jimmy was a member of the 101st Airborne Division of Paratroopers, known as the Screaming Eagles. In the pre-dawn hours of June 6, 1944, he jumped behind German lines in the invasion of Normandy. Within 24 hours, he was captured by the Germans and placed on a train headed to a, PW, a POW camp somewhere in the heart of Germany. When opportunity presented itself, Jimmy and another man made a daring leap from the speeding train. The two men ran until dawn, uncertain if they were in France or Germany. They had the good fortune of being captured by the French resistant forces and continued their fight against the Nazis with the French underground. However, after a few weeks, Jimmy was once again forced to flee with the Germans in pursuit. He eluded capture in a small French town, which by a miraculous coincidence was the birthplace of his mother living back in West Orange. He actually took refuge with cousins who helped conceal him from the Germans. Jimmy was eventually reunited with his unit, but refused to come home. He was subsequently wounded at the Battle of the Bulge and survived the war and returned home a hero. He served as West Orange mayor from 1958 to 1966. Jimmy passed away in 2007 at the age of 84. A book entitled No Surrender was released in February 2011, recounting his wartime memoirs in vivid detail. Certainly, countless books have been written about the wartime experiences of many soldiers on each day, each one adding valuable insight to the developing events of that day. Many soldiers, however, never spoke about because they often struggled with themselves to try and make sense of their own survival while witnessing their friends and comrades die before their eyes. Words couldn't adequately describe it, pictures couldn't completely explain it, so many kept to themselves, resulting in a near equal amount of stories which likely went untold. Such is the story of one D-Day survivor from the Oranges named Hugo, Hugo Giannini, who settled in West Orange after the war. He drew what he saw on Omaha Beach on June 6, 1944, and his sketches remain as the only ones ever made that day while the deadly battle unfolded before, the, before his eyes. But fate can be even a mightier force than the guns of the enemy. Clinging to hope can overcome fear as nervous anticipation gives way to the harsh realities of desperate situations. Despair and anguish are your only companions, keeping you alive in the constant peril looming on death's door. But Hugo never spoke of his incredible story for survival. In fact, his DJ drawings, which remained with him throughout the war, were concealed and hidden away in his West Orange home and not even discovered until after his death in 1993 by his wife, Maxine. Hugo was part of the 116th Regiment of the 29th Division on the morning of June 6, 1944. The 37 men of his platoon were in a landing craft as they approached the landing zone on Omaha Beach, codenamed Dog Green Sector. Amidst the abundance of confusion and chaos, Hugo's landing craft never had the luxury of making a beach landing. The doors opened to full 50 or 60 yards from the beach. The men were forced to exit with their full complement of equipment into deep water while under constant, fu constant fire from the German machine guns. Within 10 minutes, the men were decimated, and 31 of the 37 soldiers in Hugo's platoon were dead. He had somehow survived the deadly onslaught and somehow managed to make it onto the beach. Once ashore, he was able to advance forward before finding his way to the cover of a small crater left behind by an exploded shell. 
who was on a slight rise, overlooked the subsequent waves of soldiers pouring onto the beach below him, pinned down by enemy gunfire and unable to advance any further. He began drawing the scene as he saw it unfolded before him. When we return from break, we will be joined in studio by Ugo's wi uh, widow, Maxine, who still lives in West Orange. She has recently written a book featuring many of the drawings as well as Ugo's wartime correspondence found by Maxine telling the amazing story that her husband left behind and was unable or unwilling to tell. Maxine herself has just returned from Normandy, France, where some of his drawings were on display for the 70th anniversary of D-Day, which has recently passed. We will be back in a moment with author and West Orange resident, Maxine Janine. I'd just like to take this opportunity to remind our viewing audience that the farmer's market will be returning to the Quigley lot at the bottom of Eagle Rock Avenue across from Our Lady of Lords Church. Every Friday beginning July 11th to October 31st, from 12 noon to 6 o'clock, there will be farm fresh produce, activities for kids, and library crafts. So please come downtown to the West Orange Farmer's Market. Welcome back. We're joined in studio by Maxine Giannini. Maxine, welcome to the show. It's, a, it's an honor and pleasure to have you here today. Now, uh, I briefly talked about your husband Ugo's uh, ordeal on, on the morning of June 6, 1944, as he landed uh, with the soldiers on D-Day. Uh, but you didn't know your husband during the war. In no. fact, you're, you're younger than your husband. Can you explain that to me? Uh, yes. Uh, I was 15 and in high school. He was 25 and on the beach. And I was introduced to him uh, when I was 21 and he was 31. So I had no idea of his war experience. You had no idea of his war experience. No. And uh, you, you were married in, uh, I think it was 1951, and, and you moved to um, uh, West Orange in 1961. Now, um, even at that time, uh, you had no idea of, uh, of um, really what your husband had gone through during the war? Exactly. Uh, I met him in 51 and we married in 55. Oh, I'm sorry, married in 55. And uh, moved to West Orange in 61. And the war really was not a topic um, uh, of our conversation. Did he ever uh, have any um, uh, thoughts about the war? Did he ever share them with you? Did he ever have any... Uh, uh, experiences? Uh... He had a, a few flashbacks. Uh, we went to Barnegat Beach uh, one year and he got in the water and he turned white. And uh, he said to me, get me out of here. And I had to drag him out of the water. He was immobilized. Now, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when he came ashore on D-Day, uh, this experience at, at, at the beach in New Jersey, uh, the drawing on the cover of the book actually is him uh, in the water. They actually came ashore uh, in deep water and had to find their way to the shore. Right. And uh, that's the, that's what you what you used on on the on the cover of the book. Now uh, he actually started making the drawings uh, on the landing craft even before coming ashore. I don't think so. No, you don't think so. No. No, I think uh, there was too much going on. He was drenched. There would be no way that uh, he, he had prepared in his backpack a little tablet of paper and some India ink, some watercolor, pencil, Conti crayon. But I don't think anything got out of that backpack until he hit the beach and found that crater and jumped into the crater. Now, he... Yeah. He may not have been prepared for what he was going to experience on uh, Omaha Beach, but he was certainly prepared uh, to draw, uh, whether it be that day or some following day. Exactly. So uh, yeah. he did have this. Yeah. Uh, and it was not allowed. It was not allowed. No, no, uh, you, no cameras, no recordings, uh, no way, uh, no photography. Nothing was allowed. No mention of dead bodies was allowed um, or places. Had he not have found himself in the uh, uh, cover of this, uh, of, of this, of this crater uh, and, and pinned down by gunfire, mm -hmm. he might not have had the opportunity to actually do any of the drawings. So, so fate really dictated uh, 
exactly. uh, what, what he did that day. Yeah. Now, when he passed away in uh, 1993, uh, you, you had no idea that these drawings existed uh, or the uh, war correspondence that he had saved um, e even existed. Um, uh, now, how did you come to know that these drawings existed? Well, the f first thing he told me in the hospital as he was lay dying, well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. Every morning that I went into the hospital the last month of his life, he was landing on Omaha Beach. He was dreaming of Omaha Beach. And when I walked in the hospital room in the morning, he'd say, get away from that, you know, that get away from that uh, tank. It's, you know, you're going to get shot. It's, you know, they're aiming for that. And he had vivid recall of that landing every single morning of, the, of his last month of life. Now, did this come as a surprise to you that uh, he, because he hadn't spoken about it uh, prior to that in any great detail, um, did this give you some sort of an indication of uh, that he was reliving and, and these flashbacks now were prevalent on his mind, that there might be more to it? I hadn't thought of, of relating it to his artwork. However, the last 10 years of his life, he was, he read something about the invasion and about World War II every single day of his life mm. and was reliving experiences at that time and doing artwork that was uh, relevant to the World War II. Now, um, in his book, uh, in, in, in part of his war t war wartime correspondence, I believe there's a letter um, where he mentions that we came ashore yesterday, or was it years ago? Mm. So uh, does a lot of his uh, wartime correspondence reflect that type of an attitude where uh, he, he, he just didn't really know Every, uh, all, everything just kind of blended together. He didn't know have any distinctions between uh, times or places. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think um, he was really a poet and, and a, a ph philosopher. And I think that he tended to uh, think things over very carefully and express what the average soldier probably would not have had access to. I think his thoughts uh, are very profound, and time was the thing he had most of. You know, it had been taken away from him. Now, I should point out, too, that in the book, uh, the wartime correspondence is uh, to a, uh, a childhood sweetheart. Uh, right. That, uh, and you don't use the real name, it's Renee, and you certainly leave out all the uh, intimate details. Um, and something happened while he was overseas uh, that broke, up, broke off this relationship uh, between them, and it affected him very profoundly, uh, and especially in his, uh, you can, you can uh, get that sense in the correspondence. Mm. Um, there's a drawing here of uh, Ugo on, uh, at Point du Hoc, and this is actually June 8th, uh, two days after the battle. And um, I, I was at, uh, I happened to be uh, two summers ago at Omaha, and I have this picture here that almost uh, looks like it's a reverse angle from the, from the, actual, uh, the actual beach uh, that he was on. Now, I also mentioned in the opening of our show about uh, another uh, West Orange resident, Jimmy Sheeran. Yeah. Uh, who was mayor of West Orange. And um, in a prior conversation, you, you mentioned to me that um, uh, Ugo never knew Jimmy Sheeran, uh, even though lived in town while he was mayor, uh, and probably for many years thereafter, up until his death, certainly. And uh, y you said that there was a great disconnect, uh, not a, a great disconnect, but uh, there was a universal silence between, between uh, yes. uh, soldiers of uh, World War II, especially those that were in combat. Um, did he ever reconnect with any of his old... Uh, uh, On the 40th anniversary uh, of D-Day, he received a correspondence from Vern Johnson, who was the commanding officer, and he wanted to go back to the 40th anniversary when Ronald Reagan made his appearance. And that was really the first time that uh, D-Day was mentioned in our relationship. That and was the first time that D-Day was mentioned in your relationship. Yeah. Uh, 
there's some pictures here. This is uh, uh, from the movie The Longest Day, and this is the, uh, when the Germans first saw the invasion. And you can see the look of, of fear and surprise on their face. And uh, this, is, this is the bunker today. Um, now, we spoke earlier. This is a picture of a landing craft, and this was a landing craft very similar to what Ugo was in. And, and, and you thought that perhaps he was even, this may even have been the landing craft. And as I mentioned, he didn't uh, actually land on the beach. They landed 60 yards away and easily had to yes. make it to the shore. That's right. And uh, all these, um, his art supplies and everything actually floated in the water with him. And, and in his backpack, in and his back. The men were loaded down, and many just drowned on the spot because the, they couldn't get out of the, their backpack. And he was only one of six men to actually make it to the beach. And, out of 37 men, out of, right. Out of 37 yeah. men in, in, yeah. in, in, in his platoon. Now, um, this here is a picture of uh, the, the approach road to Omaha Beach. Now, you say this is known as the Vierville Draw. The Vierville Draw. And yeah. uh, actually, in this picture, there is a monument, uh, and that's the insignia of the 29th uh, uh, division, division. That, right. that, that he was right. part of. And this is yeah. the exact spot, uh, Dog Green Sector, where they actually where they actually came ashore that day. Now, you've been to Omaha. In fact, uh, mm -hmm. you just returned for the 70th anniversary. Right. And um, what were your thoughts about the 70th anniversary? What, was, what did you experience there? Well, it was um, very sad because these were very old men, just a few surviving old men. And their responses still are terribly intense. You know, and uh, they're, they're emotionally scored. Well, needless to forever, say, forever, forever, and and I know, yeah. and I know that this is still, uh, even all these years later, this is still, in in a sense, an emotional draw for you to to talk about these things and to, and to relive relive these experiences. I have a picture here of the uh, uh, of a um, machine gun nest, German machine gun nest that was likely there on that day. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to um, uh, mention the fact that your book doesn't just deal with D-Day. It deals with drawings and artwork that uh, he had uh, drawn beginning with D-Day or slightly before and uh, lasted throughout the war. And the book in, in, in concludes with, uh, with artwork. What can you tell me about, about the, what else is in the book? Well, D-Day was the first day of 244 days of combat. For him? Yes, and the 29th Division uh, landed on D-Day and they were an assault uh, rifle division and they were the second uh, largest loss in the war. The first one was the big red one who had been in Sicily prior to them. Now the, the, the uh, big red one, the first army division yeah. on the 29th, they all came ashore on, uh, on D-Day. Exactly. Um, Maxine, I want to uh, thank you very much for, for coming and sharing some thoughts with us today. And, and as I mentioned to you before, that uh, the two most important days I feel in someone's life is, is the day they are born and, and the day they figure out why. And uh, uh, I hope that that thought uh, we can leave and, and further inspire you to uh, promote your, um, your husband's book, uh, Husband's Story, uh, Drawing D-Day by uh, Maxine Janani. Nini, I'm sorry. <laughs> Maxine, thank you for joining My us. My pleasure. Thank you. If anyone would like to contact the show, you can do so online. Here is my email address. It's very simple to remember, Joseph Fagan, my name, at westorangehistory.com. Or if you prefer the old-fashioned way, you can contact me via the downtown West Orange Alliance at 66 Main Street in West Orange. And, of course, that's the same address as West Orange Town Hall. Two summers ago, I had the good fortune of visiting Omaha Beach on the English Channel along the Normandy coast. I found the incoming tide gently washing swift rolling waves harmlessly upon the sands of this once blood-washed beach. Upon first glance, anyone evenly remotely aware of its history can easily and immediately be overwhelmed and awestruck as I was. Today, it is a most inviting place with the former sound of machine gun fire and exploding mines have long gone silent, their impact upon history forever echoing through the corridor of time. Only a deafening, peaceful silence remains today, as if closely guarding the memory of her many brave heroes. 
I hardly felt worthy leaving my footprints upon this beach as my thoughts turned to all those who fought and died there. On Omaha Beach, anguish and fear instantly turned to bravery and courage as, soldier, as soldiers ultimately achieved the final victory. For the boys of 44, their mission may be over, but in many ways may never be complete. This hallowed ground will forever bear witness to the place of freedom was defended and in many ways reborn. Freedom is not an idea. It is an enduring belief and forever remembered thanks in part to Maxine Giannini's book, Drawing D-Day. For the downtown West Orange Alliance, I'm Joe Fagan, and I'll see you on Main Street.